boom welcome well, had a slight delay yeah. had a slight delay in the video so we heard your version of the of the <laughs> opening that was pretty cool <laughs> yes bam, bam. aloha charles how are you buddy well i think right now my mouth is moving but the words are coming out a little bit slower don't you think so oh, man, you're, you're... Uh oh now you're frozen uh oh how's oh, that you're good i i see you you're a little you're a little um blurry i don't know why okay how's this oh gosh clear check go closer yeah Oh no, you're good. You're good now. You're good. Okay. All right. Well, hi you, bro. Welcome on this uh hump day, Wednesday, September 2nd. I'm Another doing... interesting <laughs> day for Habaine. It's, oh boy. Hey, we, we cannot get a break, man. We just cannot get a break. No, no, boy. You know, I don't know what it is. I it could be we've been out of school so long we forget two plus two is two you know what i mean it's just just the news one after another it's just you know bad Not, i wouldn't say bad it's just sad because it's a reflection of on all of us really right throughout the entire well, I, I mean i think it, it it is definitely a uh a reflection on the state um, you know, and we're part of the state. So I guess in some respect, yeah, it is. But, you know, I don't know how many times, I don't know how many times you can get slapped in the face and, uh, and, and, and no, no learn, you know, uh, and if you guys wonder what the heck we're talking about, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. about today's news about, you know the shining light that was going to fix the uh contact tracing program remember not long ago uh, yep governor came out and he said he's removing bruce anderson and sarah park and re replacing them with this wonderful woman yep. who had all the uh experience and and uh and then today she she leaves she goes on leave because uh she says she'll come back when they have their communication and their chain of command in order what an embarrass i mean embarrassing 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 and uh kind of ties right into what we're going to be discussing tonight with our guest uh les kondo the hawaii state auditor but uh you know charlie it's it's every day i mean you know we had planned from the beginning that we were gonna transition off of COVID and start you know talking about fun stuff and 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 issues that we all could get involved with in the state, you know, and and uh, and here we are, what six months, seven months later, still on COVID. And uh, I mean, hate to say, man, I, I think we kind of called it from the beginning, you know. I think uh, everything that we talked about from the beginning has turned out to be true. So it's, uh, and I don't say that to brag because I think we weren't the only ones. Um, not a big deal. We know the correct date. Oh, did I mess up on the date again? Oh my gosh. Yeah, September. Uh, it's September second. Uh, I'll tell you. I sorry guys. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. Put it put it in a banner. Let them know in the banner that it's September. Uh, I'll actually I'll actually go fix it. I'll just go fix it. But anyway, guys, you know, um, guys and gals. Uh, you know, as, as Mel was saying, we, we were hoping that we could transition out into something more fun. But as you know, that, you know, once an investigator, always an investigator. And all of these hiccups that's coming about, I think, you know, I, I shared with Mel that we need to stick with it because a lot of people watch this show. A lot of people want to know. And we have a tendency of finding out some information before others get to it so you know to our loyalty is to you the viewers out there who have stuck with us and for all the newer newer uh, viewers our loyalty is to inform and educate and we're going to stick with that motto and we're going to follow this thing through we're not going to leave anybody uh, up a stream with no paddle okay we're going to stick with it and we're going to get down to the bottom of the truth and if it means 
getting dirty and getting uh, our hands in the mud, as they say, we're going to do it because, you know, as a taxpayer, none of us deserve the kind of treatment we're getting. And that is many times, and I, I said it for the first time in a post that I did today, I was very angry. You know, normally I just take it in stride and just let it be and let's see what happens. But I'm very angry because I have grandchildren. I have children. As a parent, I never wanted them to be subjected to what's happening right now. The virus is one thing. That's number one. The second part is how they're handling the virus, meaning what kind of programs are they implementing. And even that we get, we're getting pounded. Now, one of the things that that really um, shocked me was the fact that we talked about it a little last night, and that was, okay, on the day of testing, we were told that the feds did not give the permit approval. Okay, that was Tuesday. And I understand by the time they responded, it was a couple hours before the testing was to start. Okay, I got it. I got it. But today is Wednesday. Tomorrow is Thursday for the second testing. And they're still going to go through with the testing. So what that tells me is that, wow, are you telling me that it's okay to defy, to defy laws? Are you telling me that it's, it's a right to, you know, to if the federal government gives us money and all they ask in return is that we follow the rules, is it okay to take the money and defy those rules? I don't think that's right. And a darn thing is slapping us right in the face. So when you, just when you think everything was over, just when you think the boogeyman was gone, we are not a boogeyman this afternoon. And that is Dr. Emily Roberson is on leave. And that whole fiasco. Now, if you read the article, she states now she was hired as of the 16th of July. Okay. But she was announced in a position just last month. Not the 16th. She was announced in a position just last month, right? To take over the contact tracing program. So I know our guest tonight was trying to get information about that, but was unsuccessful. I don't know if he'll talk to us about it, if he'll be able to share, shed some light on it, but it'd be real interesting to know what the heck went on. What went on? Well, I, you know, I, the, the nice thing about the auditor's office is uh, they, and we spoke of this last week, I think, that, you know, he, he's an independent, his office is independent, um, and they have, uh, you know, they have every right to look into any part of state government, and, you know, mm -hmm. that's their function, and that's their function, and, you know, he was, I heard the governor talk about, and we'll talk about this later tonight, but the governor talked about we're in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, we're not going to waste our time answering the auditor's questions. Well, you know, I I am a total advocate of, of uh, audits uh, in government, in, in private business, you know, I mean, to, to run effectively, efficiently, to get recommendations of how you can make your operation run smoother and uh, more more effective effectively and at less cost and all of these things that audits provide it's a tool mm -hmm. but you know it's just no one in government likes audits because they're afraid that uh, they'll be exposed you know and I, I can tell you this from experience you know i as a council member for many years i requested numerous audits and the way it worked on Kauai, if the council wanted to have the auditor look into uh, or do an audit we needed to get the majority of the council and <laughs> I could never get the votes. Uh, council members over the years, way back to in the early 2000s, when uh, I was asking for audits of solid ways of planning and, and all these different departments that I felt needed help in the way of an audit, and I could never get the votes. Uh, you know, the administration, whichever administration at the time, did not want an audit done on their administration. So, you know, they made a few phone calls, got four council members to vote no, and then they went to audit. But uh, till today, I stand here telling you that that is a tool that any administration should welcome. Yes. You know, unless you're doing something wrong, 
then then you don't want an audit. But if you truly, honestly want to run an effective, efficient operation, then you would welcome an audit. And uh, and we'll hear more about the state's audit function uh, when when Les comes on in a few minutes. But you know, this here at at what we were experiencing with pan with the pandemic, I would have welcomed. If I was a governor, I would have welcomed the uh, the audit. I would have welcomed. I would have. I would have made the the time for our uh, the key people in the department to spend half an hour, an hour with the auditor answering some questions. If you really sincerely, truly wanted to improve your process, you'd welcome that. But in this case, as we read and we saw in the news, uh, Les Kondo got stonewalled, in not only the Department of Health but at the Department of Education. We'll talk about the two reports tonight. So yeah. I, I only imagine how frustrated this guy is. And this guy is awesome at what he does. I can honestly tell you, I, I've known Les for a long time. I've known Les Kondo now probably uh, 10, 12 years maybe. And uh, he used to be at the Office of, Office of Information Practice practices mm -hmm. with the state. So I've known him for a long time. This guy, is, he's not, he doesn't mess around. And I'm hoping that he will be, uh, you know, I, I, I'm almost positive that he's going to give us the, the the true scoops tonight, and I'm looking forward to it, man. I really am. You know, I, I saw I saw something on a little while ago, and you know, since Friday we we have an open night Friday. Why don't you use your your special talents in seeing if uh, Congresswoman Gabbard would like to come on and discuss discuss this whole thing, since she was uh, oh. she was talking about. Uh, and she, she shook some trees to get the Congress to get a response about the 50 million for contact tracing. And uh, that should be released, I guess, whenever they release that information. But this would be something very interesting to talk about now that we have this going on. Maybe that'd be a, an idea. I'll reach out and see if she's available. I know she was on the news tonight calling for the removal of, uh, of uh, Dr. Park. And so was... Uh, House Speaker Psyche. Yes. Asking the governor to remove her immediately, which is, uh, you know, this governor has got to be, his back is against the wall. And at some point, you know, you got to put the politics, the personalities aside, and you got to do what's right. And uh, sometimes it's not popular. It's not, it's not, it's an easy, easy, I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. But again, man, if, if you're in there for the betterment of everyone and for the state, then you got to do the, the make those tough calls. And as uh, I as far as Dr. Park is concerned, you know, it's like a football game, Charlie, and, and you see it all the time. You see it all the time where you're having a bad day, whether you're a quarterback or running back, you're having a bad day and the coach pulls you uh, and, and puts someone else's in who's having a better day. That's kind of how this thing works. You, 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 we're, we're, I mean, how can you dispute the fact that we are not getting it done? Uh, we are, we're not. And in fact, the governor, which was quite shocking, we talked about this last night, for him to come out and say that he has not lost confidence in any of the of them, I was, wow. I was kind of surprised because the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. I mean, we, we, we failed at contact tracing. We failed at testing. We failed in the DOE. We failed in unemployment. We are failing in every single department that uh, that is impacted by COVID. Um, and and for you to go up there as a governor and say, I, you know, I haven't lost confidence in anyone. I mean, I think we're we're doing well. Oh, you, you know, know man. really, what's really strange, and, and I don't want to start laughing now, <laughs> but I can't help it. Is that there must be a playbook in the state. That whenever things are not going well, you either ask for a leave <laughs> or you ask, I want to retire. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what happened was, and I can't remember what movie, is an old older football movie where the one team they go switch out the playbook with the other team. Yeah. They, they'd sneak in the locker room, switch them. I think that's what had happened. I, you know, I think they just lost a playbook, uh, and, and they just don't have a playbook. But anyway, Mr. Kondo is in. He can hear us, so I can see him smiling over there. He, can, he cannot see us yet, but we're going to bring him in right now. Um, boom. Aloha, Les. How are you? Good. 
Uh, how are you doing, Mel? Good to see you. Uh, yeah, same here, man. Uh, virtually. Yeah. Hey, Charlie. Good to meet you too. Same here, Les. Same yeah, here. That, that, that is yeah. Charlie Iona. Uh, Les, I don't know what the hell is wrong, but you look the same as the last time I saw you in person, many, 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 many years ago. And <laughs> it, it's the camera. Uh, I, it's the lighting in the camera. I don't think so. <laughs> I get on camera and I get lighting, and I look like an old fart now, and, I, and uh, because I am. But anyway, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. We got a lot of people looking forward to tonight when we put up the graphic and a lot of people looking. Uh, you, you know, our show is simply about informing and educating. And, and we, we, Charlie and I could never do this without our guests that, that are on the front line and, and actually doing the work. So we have been blessed with people like you who are willing to come on and share so our viewers can hear it firsthand and not rely on the news or, or definitely not social media uh, to get to get it right. And I'm hoping that, that you can provide that uh, for us tonight. I know, um, I don't know how many people, you know, the auditor is one of those positions no one knows about, no one thinks about until something happens. And then it's like, holy moly. So why don't we start, Les, if you could introduce yourself, talk a little bit about, you know, your background, and then maybe share a little bit about what is the function of the uh, the state auditor's office or the state office of the auditor and then we'll, and then we'll go from there how's that no that sounds great no thank you uh i've never done this before so i'm excited to to, to be able to participate so thanks for having me um so my name's les kondo and and i am the the state auditor um my position is an appointed position it's appointed by the legislature joint session of the legislature and it's for a term of eight years so i've been the state auditor for about um I guess a little over four years. I think my start date is May 1st. So about four and a few months. Um, I, I think that a lot of people, when they hear state auditor, state auditor's office, they think that, uh, that my office is a bunch of CPAs and accountants and, and we spend our days looking at, uh, at financial records and uh, looking at financial statements. And, and that's absolutely not the case. Um, what we do is we actually are responsible for contracting out the financial audits of about 22 or 23 state departments, state programs, state agencies. Uh, so we do that through um, contracts with CPA firms, and we have um, we have people on staff that are CPAs. You know, we have a terrific office. So I know that you asked me to talk first about myself, but but let me talk a little real quick about the folks in my office. We have 20, 21 other people in my office, top to bottom. Just absolutely a terrific group. We have a, a whole mix of different kind of people. We have attorneys, we have CPAs and accountants. We have folks that used to be in in the media, both print print media as well as TV media. We have folks that were in the real estate profession. So for some folks, they've been in state government for a while. Other folks, this is their first state government job. So it's really a terrific mix of professionals. Um, and I tell folks when, when they come through for interviews, it, it reminds me of a small law office. It doesn't remind me of a government office at all. And, and I can promise you to a man, to a person, uh, top to bottom, we all kind of drink out of the same Kool-Aid container. So we all are there trying to make government better. I mean, we're all trying to do our small part to try to try to move the ball in the right direction. So, um, you know, uh, we just have a terrific office. So before I forget to, to, to say that and, and, to, and to let everyone know that, that you have a terrific state auditor's office, not me for sure, but it's the people that are behind me that make me look good. It, it is a terrific group. Um, so about myself, so I'm an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an accountant. Um, and I have been in, in state government now for, I think it's 17 years. Uh, I was in private practice for a number of years. I was a litigator. My first, um, my first job in state government, I was uh, at the Office of Information Practices. And, and actually, that's the office that oversees um, our state's uh, freedom of information law, which is called the Uniform Information Practices Act, as well as the Sunshine Law that applies to uh, board and commission meetings. In fact, that's the first time I met Mel. Mel was uh, the chair of the Kauai County Council, and, and we have set, we had some discussions uh, and some issues, and, and I think actually Mel sued me. <laughs> but you know, those are those are old things, and we've moved forward. Um, and and since then, uh, I moved from the Office of Information Practices. I served as a commissioner on the Public Utilities Commission for a number of years, uh, and then I was the um, executive director and general counsel for the State Ethics Commission before I became the state auditor. So I've had a really interesting 
state career, uh, and I guess some people would say it's in it's in the the area of good government. So I think that every stop that I've made along the way, it's really uh, really built a solid foundation for the job that I do now. So you know, I mentioned that my office. Um, does not do the financial audits, that we are just contracting out those financial audits of the state programs, state agencies to CPA firms. So what my office does is we do, our bread and butter is performance audits. So what we're doing is we are assessing whether or not an agency or a program, whether or not they're achieving their mission and they're doing it effectively and efficiently and ethically. Um, we're making sure that the, that not only is the is that agency doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they are they're taking you know good use of state money and doing their work. Uh, our mission really is to is to help improve government through through objective analysis and. We are a nonpartisan office, even though I am appointed position by, by the legislature. Um, we do not get any interference, and I promise you, no interference from anybody. And, and um, Mel knows me well enough, I think, to know that if we did get interference, uh, we would push back or I would push back really hard. So we are, we are an independent um, office that provides, I hope, objective and unbiased assessments of different programs. So that's kind of what we do and, and, um, and, and a little about myself. Um, I'm, well, maybe I can even talk a little more about, about some of the things that we do. If you, if you want, I'm, I'm happy to share some of the different, um, you know, kind of audits that we do that, that have maybe made some of the news, maybe not, but it may be informative for some folks that are still questioning what the heck does he do and what does that office do? Well, I, I know for a fact that, um, like I said, whenever your audits come out, it, it makes the news and, and it's always it's the same story with every with every audit, you know, the auditing, uh, the audited organization or agency, you know, will will have comments and, and so forth. But I, I did want to say that as far as the financial audits, um, just for our viewers, <clears throat> information that the county of Hawaii is run the same way although our auditor's office is vacant right now uh, we've never uh, did our financial audits in-house it's always outsourced to a third-party CPA firm uh, typically from Honolulu uh, and they come in and and you want that for the financial audit you don't want that done by an internal uh, state uh, office or a state department you want that done outside so uh, one question that if you could answer someone asked you control your uh, your audits. Uh, the, I know there's there's sometimes that the legislature will request an audit, but for the most part, how does an audit audit start? Who, who initiates the audit in the state auditor's office? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, and and I'm hoping that, that that some people that may be wanting to contact my office directly after this after this discussion today, that maybe this is good information from them. Uh, most of our work is dictated to us by the legislature. So during session, we see um, bills that, that the governor eventually signs into an act that may be directing us to do an audit. Uh, we have some of those ongoing right now. Right now, we are auditing the Agribusiness Development Corporation, which is uh, attached for administrative purposes only to the Department of Agriculture. So that is an audit that was mandated by legislative act. We have um, other audits that come to us or other work, not just audits, but other types of work in addition to performance audits that come to us through concurrent resolution. Uh, we don't have as many auditors or staff as I would like to have. Our office is 21 other people, which includes secretarial support, as well as IT support, as well as our writers and our graphic uh, graphic design team. But um, so we can't do everything. So there's there are times when we get single house resolutions asking us to audit this or look at that. Uh, and those we really don't have a chance to, to jump into just because we just don't have the, the personnel to be able to do that. Uh, a lot of the audit work that we're asked to do, we're asked to report 20 days before session. So often we get a we get an audit request or we get a, an act that gets passed by the governor. So we get work that starts maybe in June or so. And we're supposed to finish that by the end of December. So during session between January and May or June, we often have an opportunity to, to um, self-select what we might want to audit. So we, there's no science to that. Um, you know, some people have asked if we should do a uh, state risk assessment to try to determine the state agencies and the state programs that, that are 
really ripe for an audit, uh, that is a challenging task and things change so frequently and sometimes we're not able to, to really estimate our the, the staffing that we might have just because of what comes down from the legislature. But when we do have the capacity, we are able to, to self-initiate some audits. So we get a pick and choose here and there, uh, audits that we think might be informative to the public, uh, things that we think might be very interesting. I'll give you an example. We looked at adult residential care homes a few years ago and, and we looked at the relicensing process for those care homes. That was a self-initiated audit where uh, we made some really significant findings, at least in my perspective, uh, that the Department of Health division that, that is in charge of care homes, they were relicensing those care homes without going through the annual relicensing process, uh, part of which requires them to do a, a, a on-site inspection of the care home. So a lot of the care homes are getting relicensed without that, that piece of the relicensing process. A lot of care homes are operating with expired licenses. Uh, so I thought that was a really significant report and I thought it was very interesting. Sometimes reports that I think are really significant, really interesting, they don't get a lot of play in the media. And, and other times we get reports that perhaps are not as interesting that get some, some media play, but, but the work we do is really, really interesting fascinating frankly but it's it's really impactful uh and i wish that there's an opportunity for for uh someone to kind of push push agencies to really implement you know the the recommendations that we make so we do make findings but we also try to include recommendations on our report meaningful recommendations that the agency can can hopefully uh implement that will really improve their operations now you know tonight and and I'm so first of all I like to say uh, it's great to meet you. I'm re very very excited to hear what you have. You know tonight, we, both Mel and I, especially myself, you know, we're both uh, retired investigator coppers, and um, we have a tendency of asking some questions. And I know that if it pertains to an ongoing audit that you do, most times we don't want you to answer it, and you just let us know. Then we'll, we'll sure. move to something else because I know how that could be cumbersome if. You start talking about something that might, you know, and, and especially when you're in the process of auditing something that might be very, very technical and very, very important that we don't want to ruin that. So I just wanted to let you know right ahead. Thank you. Yeah. But uh, uh, step one, uh, when when Mel first mentioned that you were coming on, I said, oh, goody, goody. So the thing is, when <laughs> you're tasked with doing an audit, uh, is the report uh made public or uh not all the time if it if sometimes when it's uh when it's done for the legislature does it go behind closed doors and and then you reveal something to them that's not revealed out in the open is that how it works no not at all all of our reports <laughs> are public documents in fact they're all posted i think i saw a chat to ask uh, if they're posted in our website all of our reports are online on our website and our website is uh auditor.hawaii spelled out dot gov g o v uh, so all of them are accessible through our website. We have talked about um, doing IT audits and we don't do any IT audits right now. And, and we've looked at other jurisdictions that have been doing it for a number of years. And I think that's the next area that we're gonna have to, to get some expertise in and, and do some IT audits. When we do that audit, it may be, and I'm saying may, cause I'm really not sure what that report looks like yet, but it may be that part of that is not gonna be public. You know, it's things that may relate to IT security, for instance. So right. if we get those kind of reports, we may have a different approach in, in publicizing some parts of that report, but perhaps there would be another report that would be um, that would be confidential or, or just for certain people to see. Yeah, okay. but right now everything is, is a public document and available through our website. Perfect. We will, we will be showing a couple of them tonight. I have it queued up to go on the screen, Les, and, and you know, we definitely will talk about the audits uh, and the reports that you did for the contact tracing and the DOE. But, uh, you know, on Kauai is the same way, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure at the state level. I know a lot of people talking about rail. I think the people got to understand the rail is a county project. It's a city and county of Honolulu project. Uh, but it, the, the state has been involved. I'm not sure. I know the feds are, are looking at the at the real spending and all of that. Is that something your office would would tackle if the legislature requested? Well, well, we did. Um, the legislature did request. So my office is we're a constitutional office. We're in the we're in the state constitution. Um, at least my position is. Uh, but um, so we have the the authority to audit uh, both the state agencies as well as the county agencies but generally there's so much um 
activity at the state level that we don't we don't get into the county uh, into county government and audit county government functions. And and another reason for that is because most of the counties have their own have their own auditor uh, and their own auditor office. So we we generally will will just focus on state government programs, state government activities. But um, when I think it's 2017, when the legislature came back into special session to um, to provide uh, heart or the, the rail project with more funding. Um, at that time, the legislature also required us to do an audit of heart. And so we issued four reports, three that were done in house and one that was done by a consultant relating to heart. So we have done, and that's since my tenure, which is about four and a half years, that's the only county agency that we've, or county program that we've audited. So yeah, that one was, that was quite popular. That made the news that, that yeah. uh, those reports were talked about pretty much uh, on the news when, when that came out. And um, that, that's just another tough issue. But uh, now your audits do come up with recommendations as well. Uh, is it like the county where of Kauai, where it's real difficult to get the administration to implement the recommendations that the auditor's office or the audit report recommends? Uh, for sometimes, I think that's a that's a true statement. We don't have any enforcement tool. So yeah. once we issue the report, it's it's to the legislature, but it's also you know to the public, to the governor, to the administration, to the to the department or the program that we actually audited. So it is our hope, and, and often it, it it they the, the agency does attempt to implement. So it is our hope that the recommendations, like I said earlier, are meaningful and can be implemented. And if implemented, will improve the program. But we leave it at that point, I think, to the legislature um, to, to push the agency to implement the report. What we do do is we come back in about two years and we assess the implementation status. So we do reports um, every year. We do a, we call it a big fat report uh, that, that takes all of the recommendations that have not been implemented. And we ask the agencies to self-report, self-report implementation status. So we're not doing any independent work. We're just reporting what the agency tells us. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes when we actually go back and we take a look, uh, we don't agree. But in about two years after the audit is, is issued, we do go back and we do assess independent assessment by us, not just relying upon the agency's uh, self-reported implementation status. We do go back and we do assess the status of that implementation, whether it's fully implemented, whether it's partially in, in, implemented, or whether they haven't even started trying to implement. And we do issue those reports that are also available on our website. So how- Auditor, auditor.hawaii.gov, guys. You guys gotta get over there. It's a well done website. One of the few state websites that's easily easily uh, navigatable, navigable. And uh, just click on reports. You can read all of the audit reports. It's amazing. So. Let me ask you, you audit the performance of, uh, of an agency uh, throughout the state. So I guess my question is, when you have someone that doesn't cooperate and, and you're trying to look at their performance, and I guess their performance that's made known, I guess, via the press, and you know somebody, somebody's trying to get to the bottom of it, how, how do you move in on something like that, especially when they don't want to participate with you or um you know down the road it may be a little bit too late to see if they're self-implementing but then you have uh, like a, a higher um uh, a higher administration that oversees that <laughs> that agency that that you're auditing if if there, there is a not a, if there's no connection there and everything just stays like jelly and doesn't move at all what do you do yeah, no, that's really a good question. I, I think, first of all, um, let, let me say that uh, the, the two reports that we just issued, the one about the Department of Health's contact tracing, um, how they do contact tracing, their, their, their approach to contact tracing, and the one about the Department of Education's COVID-19 you know, policies and procedures, both of them were reports. They weren't audits. So the audits that we issue, they all, have, they are, they all are done pursuant to uh, this this standard government accounting standards that is issued by the USGAO. So those are really a different you know kind of kettle of fish than the kind of reports that we just issued. So if I take your question, Charlie, and and we talk about the audits themselves, uh, mm -hmm. very few times do we get no cooperation. 
most of the time we are getting cooperation from the agencies. By law, uh, at least as I interpret the statute, they're required to cooperate with us. And, uh, you know, honestly, I think that um, the, the hammer that we have isn't so much us, but it's also the legislature because most of this work, like I said earlier, is done at their request. And I would hope that um, to the extent that, sorry, my dog is wanting a pet, but uh, to the extent that they, um, that we don't get cooperation, I'm hoping the legislature will help us out and, and force the agency either to cooperate or, or you know, kind of take a pound of flesh out of the agency kind of thing for not, for not cooperating. So, you know, that all said, we go through a process for audits that's consistent with the standards in that, it, it's called the yellow book, that, that publication that I was talking about. So we go through a process where we, we go through a risk assessment, we identify audit objectives. So these are the questions that we're gonna answer when we go and we do an audit. So once we have those objectives and we've gone through a process where we believe very confidently that we have enough evidence or we're gonna get enough evidence uh, through our process to be able to support whatever conclusions, whatever findings we make. Uh, so we start right there. If we don't think we're gonna have enough evidence that we can't access evidence, information, people, for instance, to be able to support a finding that that finding might not be on solid foundation, we don't even consider that as an objective. But when we actually have objectives and we're confident at that period of time that we're gonna be able to do our audit work, okay, that's when we have problems when agencies don't cooperate. So the one that is you know, front and center for us and is still an issue that's ongoing is OHA. So we audit OHA every two years, uh, I'm sorry, uh, every four years by statute. And we just issued an audit, I don't know, about two or three years ago about OHA. The legislature decided that they wanted us to audit OHA again, in between the cycle. So we did, we started an audit of OHA and actually our objectives were to assess and report about the LLCs that OHA has. Fantastically you know, interesting subject matter for us. And we had identified that as a area for further, sub, for further review when we did the audit the first time. So we went through our process, we spoke with people, and then we got kind of the brick wall where OHA didn't wanna give us information. And these are, um, executive session minutes uh, about discussions involving those LLCs. And we interpret our statute to uh, give us access to any document that an agency has. And, you know, OHA, state agency, uh, I don't think there's any dispute that OHA is subject to whatever state laws. And I think actually the LLCs as well. So that's a situation where we hit us, we hit, we, we both, this, we both, we stuck to our guns that we needed this information to complete the audit uh, and OHA decided that they weren't gonna give us access. So in that case, we actually have suspended the audit. So we cannot complete the audit because we don't have access to the information that we need. We, we believe is necessary to be able to complete the audit. So if we issue a report, it's likely that those findings, whatever we say in the report, it, maybe not likely, but it's possible that those findings that we have in that report, that they won't be supported by sufficient evidence because of the information that we don't know. So in the case of an audit, it's likely that we would end up suspending the report, assuming that we decided initially that we thought at the time we made our audit objectives, that we thought we would have enough information. So I, I gave you a really long answer to your kind of very, very succinct question there, but I hope it was uh, clear enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. Got it. The last we heard of the OHA audit was that, that in fact, uh, you were suspending the audit because you weren't being provided the information that was being requested. That's the last I heard. What's the status? Has there been any changes with that? Oh, yeah, there, there's been a couple changes. Uh, OHA actually sued me or sued my office. Uh, so we actually are in court, which I think is just my, my personal feeling. It, it is not the way that state agencies should should deal with each other, that one agency sues another agency and incurs, both of us, I think, are incurring substantial attorney's fees just to resolve uh, an issue between state agencies. I, I just don't think that's the right way that um, that these disputes need to get resolved. I, I feel like there were enough protections that we we provided OHA, that we explained not only that there was case law that seemed to, to, to provide them some protection, but also our own statute uh, that, that that requires or, or provides that work papers 
the information that we gather, both interviews as well as documents that we gather for purposes of, of our work, that it's confidential by law. So, you know, I tell folks that's not a guarantee, but, you know, absent a court order, we're not turning over anything that we, we get from an agency. So I feel like there was enough um, protections, if that's the right word in place, that we should have been able to resolve this with OHA. But, uh, you know, obviously they didn't agree with what, what, I, what I was my thinking anyway. Oh, that's sad. That's sad. I mean, I, the way I read the statute is you guys have access to any and all. Uh, that, that's what it says, Mel. And, and you know what? You can be my attorney anytime there. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we, we don't even normally bring attorneys on i i mean uh, yeah you're the people love you though man i'm reading the comments they're they're having a blast so anyway um <laughs> we don't have much time but i we did want to discuss that those two reports um sure. the contact tracing let's start off with that one because that made the news first and uh and then we can move on to the department of education but let's start off how did how did these reports get initiated was that initiated out of your office well well let me let me take a step back of it for for two minutes so sure. when when this pandemic happened you know in march we were ordered to work from home so my office we transitioned and and i gotta say i was really proud of everyone because we didn't have any any real hiccups along the way but what we did and it and maybe it was forced on us that our audits that were ongoing, and we have one about adult correction officers and, and the overtime, it all got kind of suspended because people were scrambling to, to work from home or to figure out how to do their jobs, you know, uh, with, with, the, with the situation that was on hand. So what we did is we tried to figure out ways that we could contribute. You know, all hands on deck was kind of our attitude. At that point, um, our audit work was suspended. The other work that we're supposed to do by statute kind of pushed a little off to the side. Let's see what we can do to kind of help. And so what we did is we looked at our old audits and we tried to identify pots of money that we thought would be meaningful uh, to fill this, this huge economic hole, the state budget hole that, you know, I think we've all heard people talking about $2.3 million, billion. I think the governor is, is using that, that number. So we identified a bunch of uh, old reports where we thought there was monies. And, and I give you an easy example. You know, we all pay five cents for the cans and bottles that, that you know, we, we buy at the grocery store. So there's a, there's a fund and it's called the Deposit Beverage Container Deposit Fund, where all of that money gets deposited into. So all the five cents that we pay at the grocery store, the five cents gets, gets sent to the Department of Health. Department of Health administers this program and it goes into this fund. There's about $50 million in that fund, five zero. And every year that fund goes up by about $7 million. And the rate of redemption is about 65%. So in other words, uh, out of 100 cans, or 100 cans and bottles, 35 are not returned, not redeemed. So that, that pot of money continues to grow. So we thought we could identify pots of money like that, that the legislature has, has very little insight into and try to help the legislature identify these, these, these funding opportunities, these pots of money that are just sitting there and perhaps use that. So I give you this long run in because that's kind of the same attitude that, that we had when we started these projects. So Department of Health, contact tracing you know there was there continues to be so much um i guess news about contact tracing and the department of health's approach to contact tracing and from our perspective it sure seemed like there was a lot of confusing information that was out there unclear information um there was things that that seemed to be uh outdated that was out there so our intent when we started this project was really to provide a report not an audit a report about um, contact tracing to provide information to legislature, to the public, so that there could be a clearer, more consistent, more up-to-date understanding about what contact tracing is. Uh, and the Department of Health, my dog is on the cord now, uh, the Department of Health's approach to contact tracing, which seemed a little different than, um, than what we were looking at other jurisdictions or even the CBC guidance. And then um, actually it was, it was your Kauai Senator, Senate President, uh, Kochi that actually uh, suggested that maybe we can work with the Senate COVID special COVID committee. I'm sorry, that's not their title, but you know, whatever that group is called. And so uh, we actually met with them and they asked us to expedite that report uh, so that they can have information. And at that moment, I know that they were involved in, in talking to the Department of Health officials about the approach to contact tracing. So that was the impetus for, for us looking at the Department of Health's contact tracing efforts. It was really just to provide 
clear, consistent, up-to-date information so that the public really would be on the on the same page as to what the department was doing. So we will all understand that, you know, and um, that unfortunately the the resulting report or our ability to report that it, it, it we, we weren't able to do what we what we really wanted to do. Well, that's interesting. And I'm glad you, you clarified that uh, regarding the Senate COVID-19 committee, uh, the special committee that Charlie and I have been following since the beginning. And they've, we've had them on our show actually several times uh, and sharing their frustration about contact tracing. And the, and the frustration was that they were being given different information from different people at different times. The numbers were changing. The numbers weren't consistent. Uh, the, 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 explanation of how many they needed didn't match with how many they had and then the, the of course the federal money that was provided and and the fact that they had supposedly had these 400 plus people on standby and and when when it got really bad all of a sudden we didn't have so that clarifies for me anyway and i think the viewers where the where the uh, need for x ex expediency came where you folks were basically asked by the committee to move it move it along let me jump in real quick, Mel, because we, we specifically told the department that we weren't here or interested in actually um, trying to determine how many contract tracers they actually had. Because I know that there, at that moment, there was a lot of controversy about what the department said. And I know that Senate committee went actually to the Department of Health and they walked around. So our report was not about trying to figure out really how many number, how many people do they have? It was really to, to try to clarify this is their process. This is their approach. Um, and and it, like I said earlier, it seemed like some of their approach was different than what we thought um, other jurisdictions were, were implementing about contact tracing. Like I give you a real easy example that really stood out to, to us was, um, you know, the Department of Health, they stood up the program or training program for contact tracers with the University of Hawaii. So they were looking for people with clinical background, at least that's what I understood initially. And they were gonna go through about a day and a half course. And then people that didn't have clinical background, they were gonna go through a six week course at the community, community college. And that was six full weeks of instruction. But when we look at other jurisdictions, we see that there's online training that you can do for free. New York contracted with John Hopkins University. You can go online right now and you can do a contact tracing training about seven hours online and it's free. Uh, so we wanted to ask the Department of Health, how come in Hawaii it's different? What is your approach and how come it's different for training contact tracers than, than you know, other jurisdictions on the mainland and even CDC? We look at other publications and it doesn't talk about having a clinical background. It talks about folks that have empathy, you know, being one of the, the strong, you guys probably would be great contact tracers because you're former investigators. It's really getting people to open up, to trust you, to be able to talk to you. And, and to me, that was really trying to understand why is the Department of Health's approach different than other jurisdictions or things that we thought at a national level that that was how contact tracing was, was uh, that, that was the approach to contact tracing. Well, you know, right from the get go, when we started uh, doing this show, uh, one of in our, our early, early on segments, uh, you know, we we brought on the mayor and then we brought on Dr. Berman and, you know, we're, we're trying to understand about contact tracing. And yet it was always told to us that, you know, you got to get this clinical stuff behind it. And we're saying, wait a minute now. We're really good at tracking down people that committed crimes. And that means that, you know, every step you take, it branches off. It continues to branch off and you need to find those branches. But with a pandemic, what's crucial, you don't allow that branches to get too far. And because you got to try to bring everything back to the center so we can hold it there so we can actually suffocate the virus from spreading. So we fast forward to now. And I think what plenty uh, people that are online just by reading the comments tonight, I think their frustration has always been. We brought this up early on in the early on game and not knowing about, you know, uh, what you did. And I think it would have been great right from the get go is to understand about contact tracing because it seemed apparent that um, they weren't really uh, heavy into it as if, you know, we got it under control, it's manageable. But then when it got so bad, uh, I mean, you, you look at, if you're looking at 5,000 cases now, um, I, and I told this to the Lieutenant Governor last night, you know, we might as well cut our losses because we can't go back. It's either the time has run out on those, on those cases and they, they recovered or we're never gonna find people. 
And you, you know, if you have the contact traces in place now, we could move forward and, and capture those. But even with today's report of the head of the supposed contact tracing program going on leave, you know, we find out that there's only 212 contact traces based on that report that was given today, when actually the Surgeon General who was here last week <laughs> recommended based on a population base, we should be between four and 500. So when, the, when this kind of stuff comes out, that's what angers the people. And that's what makes it even hard for compliance, trying to get compliance so we don't have this spread continue, you know? And I think that's, boy, it's, it, it's a tough nut to crack, but that, that's where it's at, boy. No, no those, are, those are great points. And I think that's kind of what we were trying to kind of get to the, the quote truth. Not so much about the numbers, like I said, but just yeah. about the approach. Because it's our understanding from reading different guidance, CDC guidance, for instance, you have to do the contact tracing between 24 and 48 hours. At, after 48 hours, you know, it's too late uh, because, you know, people go and they have other contacts and that, that circle gets bigger and bigger. So we wanted to understand, you know, how many of the, the, the contact tracing folks, how many times are they being able to, to stay within that 48 hours? How do you get people to answer the phone? This is a big question that, that you know, I had, and, and we actually had a chance to talk to Dr. Anderson, but uh, like we report, um, he deferred a lot of the questions to Dr. Park. So that was one of the questions. And we don't see any, you know, public service announcements or any kind of, you know, advertising by the Department of Health or anyone else. When someone calls you, how do you know that it's Department of Health and you actually pick up the phone and you talk to that person? If you get an email, how do you know it's from the Department of Health? So those are really important questions because, Someone's got to answer your questions. You I mean it's great if you if you're really skilled and you can get people to talk to you, but you got to get them to pick up the phone first. And then you know your question about you know the the different societies and the different folks. I mean we read about the Pacific Island communities and right. and perhaps right. the challenges, whether it's the language, whether it's the culture, whether it's the ability to to self quarantine or self isolate if you actually are sick, and and maybe they don't have that ability. So that was another question that we wanted to ask is. What are the other services that you're offering to people when you actually contact them? Are you offering them hotel or a place that they can actually self quarantine if they don't have the ability to do that at home? And, and that's another thing. And I'm, and I'm sorry, I kind of have just, just going on and on here, but um, self quarantine, I'm not sure everyone understands what that means. You know, and I think that's another important, you know, bit of information that should be pushed out to the public. You know, what that means is either your entire family is staying home for the 14 days with you, or you need to have an area where you can be by yourself, a room, maybe a bathroom, or you're going to have to do a lot of cleaning behind yourself if you use the bathroom. You shouldn't be eating dinner and lunch and breakfast with your family. You're going to be by yourself unless your entire family is self-quarantined. And a lot of folks don't have that, that kind of room in their house. So when we asked Dr. Anderson about at that moment, which is about a week ago now, how many rooms? And and I know that he doesn't know precisely, and that's that's stuff that's too much in the weeds, but he threw out a number, about 40 hotel rooms, about 40. And I know that since then, the Deputy Director of Health has talked about having 300, and they're still getting more online. You know, but as we asked Dr. Anderson, you know, okay, just using my simple math, if we have 200 infections a day, those are the cases. They need to self-isolate, which is basically self-quarantine, but you know you're sick. Okay, so if I have, let's say, we use the number two, uh, two close contacts per infected case, but I'm really bad at math, so I'm gonna use the number four. Okay, so that means for 200, that means you got 800 contacts. That means every day there's a thousand people that gotta self quarantine or self isolate. Okay, that in 14 days, that's 14,000 people. Even if I cut that in half and I say half of those are family members that's still 7,000 people that got to figure out if they can self-isolate or self-quarantine in their residence, okay? Is there only 40 people that can't do that? I thought that was not, that, 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 didn't, that didn't sit well with me. I thought that that didn't seem logical. So I think that they're improving that right now when I hear the Deputy Director of Health saying that they're getting more rooms and I hear the Mayor of Honolulu saying that he's helping and getting more rooms, but there's probably a lot of rooms that you're gonna need. There's also other services that you got to offer if you have people self-quarantine and self-isolating. Those services are like food. How are they going to get food if they can't get out of their house, right? So medicine, laundry. So there's other support services that should be offered. We didn't get a chance to ask about whether the Department of Health is offering those kind of services. You know, maybe the bigger issue is how often are they contacting these people that are close contacts that have been instructed to self-quarantine or self-isolate? Because 
they got to be contacted regularly to be asked, how you feeling? You sick? You know, you have temperature, all those kind of questions, unless they're left with really clear instructions the very first time they're contacted. So those are the kind of questions that we really thought were important to get information about so that we could report it. So it would be really clear to the public as to what the approach was by the Department of Health. And and unfortunately, you can probably tell by, by you know, my frustration here as I'm going on and on that I really thought it was going to be a very valuable report, not only for us. But Department of Education won same thing. I thought it was going to be very valuable for the Department of Health because we were going to do them a service by providing clear, objective information, up-to-date information to the public. And, and that's what I think is not being done well right now. And that's why I think there's a lot of frustration and confusion. So we were going to actually be able to kind of help Department of Health as well as Department of, of Education by doing that. And, and we just weren't successful. That's just, you know, too bad. Let, let me just do a real quick follow-up. Sure. So we know that all the agencies going down, they take their lead. If the governor speaks, they move. They, they, they move. I mean, that's just, that's just basic logic. I would think at this point, because we're running into so many problems, like using a tunnel, not getting proper permission from the federal government. You know, it's if it's one thing after another, and it almost seems as if, our administration needs to have their hand held and somebody needs to walk with them so they don't get in trouble because it's, it's happening more frequently now. So if we can see all of this unfolding, how does, and, 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 you, and you said a very important thing, and that is getting the information out, getting the information out, which is key. But if we're not getting, if we are not getting that information and the administration is doing something that as a law-abiding citizen, I wouldn't do it because we know that's not right. How do they expect us to say, hey, if we're going to fight this virus, you need to follow these rules. And yet we're saying, okay, but you're not following rules too. So why should I follow the rules? You know, it, it starts to get this, this mishmash go back and forth. And I, I think, you know, we, we got to, you know, somebody got to say, we stop the press. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of people in here saying, we need to hear more from the lieutenant governor because why? He's a doctor. It makes sense. You're fighting a pandemic. Why not hear a doctor? But we're hearing we're hearing things from people that that are not doctors, or they're they're telling us. And, and it's a good thing that the surgeon general came by. It's impressive, but you know we need somebody on the boots on the ground that's doing it every single day, so we can we can all march to uh, uh, to uh, a successful uh, completion of getting rid of this virus. Because that's where everything is, lies right now. Everybody's worrying about this darn virus because why? It's not allowing us to open up our economy. Plain and simple. We're, 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 we're getting dirty lickings right now. A, a lot of the things that you're talking about are way above my pay grade. But, <laughs> but I got to say, I, I got to say that the thing that we were very, um, uh, what we were trying to do, and, and it's, it's reflected in in the auditor comments that are just the great section of the, of the two reports. Uh, transparency and, and and honestly, this is my my feeling from the bottom of my heart, kind of thing right now. Transparency, state government, that's part of our culture. I mean, we have we have freedom of information laws. You know, we're a government of the people, by the people, for the people. We're a democracy where people get to participate in decision making. Uh, during a pandemic, during the current current situation, more important than ever, you know, all that stuff sounds great and everything. It's part of our, our our fabric, so to speak, of our democracy. But right now, it's more important than ever to provide transparency, to provide information to the public, to let people know what's going on. And and I think that's the part that is um, it, that that's where we're struggling right now. And and that's the frustration I think in our ability to not be able to report about the Department of Health as well as the Department of Education is right now, it's not time to hide the ball. Right now it's time to, to let folks know. And, and I tell folks, even in my own office, I tell folks, hey, you know what? It's okay to make a mistake right now. You know, this is, we don't have a playbook, right? This, this is all brand new, you know, all new for us. We're, we're just trying to learn on the fly kind of thing. So it's okay to make mistakes, but you got to do things. And then you got to own up to those mistakes because you're going to improve and do things better. So you got to tell people, hey, you know what? We, and people will understand, at least, at least personally, I would understand because like I said, th th this is unprecedented, right? There's, there's no 
there's no game plan that you're following. So that's the challenge right now is I think that there's not a lot of information that's coming out, whether it's about contact tracing in the Department of Education report. The thing that we wanted to understand is how come the department isn't pushing out information about what happens when there's a positive case on campus. So, you know, this report came out, you know, last week, Friday, we already have teachers and some kids back on campus. They're, they're doing learning on campus. They're doing teaching on campus. We know that there's been positive cases on campus, summer school and even after summer school. Yet we don't know where. We don't know what the policy is by the department in terms of how they clean up the school, you know, how they let people know that there's been positive cases, contact tracing, if they do contact tracing, there's a lot of stuff that's left to the, the principals, the individual principals at the school level. Uh, but the information right now is key and it's not getting out there. So students, teachers, families are making really important decisions about going back to campus and they need this information. This is not just information about whether their kids are going to learn or not. This is information that really relates to health and safety of their themselves, their kids, their families. So it's really important information. And, and that's the disappointment about um, the, the walls that we hit is we weren't able to provide that information out to the public. And like I said earlier, it really would be, we were doing um, work that the, that the Department of Education that they need to do. So, you know, I, I thought that we were there to help. And unfortunately that's not how the Department of Education saw what we were trying to do. Well, you know, it was probably six months ago, five months ago, we had a Senate COVID committee on and, and we recommended or suggested that they hire for retired police officers. Uh, they thought it was a good idea. And uh, of course, it was it was the Department of Health that said, no, they need to have a bachelor's degree and they need to have a clinical background and all that crap. And most, I don't know, I couldn't find another jurisdiction in this country that had that requirement. So that that's just one of the problems. And then Charlie, talked about, uh, you know, they needing someone to hold their hand, leading them down the road. The, the, and that's what audits and reports do. That's, they, had a, they had an opportunity, I thought, um, to work with your office to come up with a solution uh, based on, on data and facts and, and uh, you know, other jurisdictions and so forth. And they chose not to. Now, the question I have is, so, so Bruce Anderson sends you over to Dr. Park and and I mean, does it get further stonewalled there? And and you know, I I, I really want to show because guys, you guys go over to that website, uh, auditor.hawaii.gov, and go take a look. Uh, take a look at the, the quality of this report. And this is just one one part of it where he talks about the process of contact tracing, and it's it's spelled out. I mean, that's your roadmap. That's someone holding your hand. This is you know again based on data from the cdc and everywhere else and and it's it goes into much more than that we shared this uh less we shared this a couple of weeks ago uh when when the news me media first had the, the the report about the auditor's office being um basically stonewalled uh so i show i did show this part of it talking about all the changes in the numbers and so forth based on the reports that they provided at the at the press conferences but I just I wanted to show this real quick because I wanted the people to see the quality of, of the report. But my point was, um, that's what they got to do. They, they need to work with the audit, uh, the auditor's office and and come up with a solution to the problems. And they chose not to. So you go to Dr. Park. What happens? Does she basically say, no, we don't have time? Yeah, we, we didn't get a chance to, to speak with Dr. Park. She didn't make herself available. Um, in fact, the only the only person from the Department of Health that we actually got to speak with was Dr. Anderson. And, you know, after a number of letters, a number of emails, he made himself available, you know, less than two hours before the time that he said he could meet with us. So uh, we were happy to meet with him. We, we were glad to be able to speak with somebody. But unfortunately, you know, kind of and I don't expect him to know maybe all of the details as to how the process or the approach is because he's the health director. You know, he's not running the program, although there's been so much controversy, he knows some things about the program. But we needed to speak to the people that were a little, you know, lower down, so to speak, the people that were actually in charge of the program, that would be Dr. Park. And then at that time, Dr. Roberson had already taken over or had been announced to take over the program. So we really wanted to speak to, to those folks to get some of the details, some of the information or answers to the questions that I was asking or I was, you know, throwing out there when we were having a little earlier discussion. You know about uh, you know how they're how how often they're they're able to make contact within the 48 hours, um, the kind of support they're offering, 
you know, how they let people know that it's the Department of Health calling and not some prank call or not somebody that that is, uh, you know, somebody that that they don't want to talk to. You know, all those kind of questions, I think, are really important. And um, yeah, I, I frankly don't know how how people are are uh, recognizing that it's the Department of Health that's calling and, and they should answer answer the answer the call and provide information. You know what what makes it uh, really um, and I'll, I'll, I'll let I just wanted to get this in. You know, you see, you talked to Dr. Park, right? And she no, we did it. not talk to Dr. Oh, no. Park. Did, okay, we did not. It, it seems almost mirroring the fact that when she goes and appears before the COVID committee, it's almost as if she's not there <laughs> talking to them, because you know, just by watching her her uh, her demeanor, I could already see, and 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 this goes towards what you said earlier about getting the information out, because all we know of Dr. Park is just her behavior on the camera. That's the only time we see her. I would think you put your best foot forward, right? You try to be the best you can in front of the camera. And because that might be the only snippet in time that people will know about you. And I, quite frankly, I don't think she, she, she did a very good job. So I'm not surprised that you weren't able to get a hold of her. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I'm surprised. I, I was expecting that we would we would have access and we'd be able to at least talk to people for, uh, you know, an hour or two hours just to get information and, and we'd be able to report that. I, I didn't expect us not to get, you know, cooperation or or some assistance. But, but I that's was shocked. I, I mean, I was shocked. And then today when I hear the news today that uh, Dr. Roberson now is saying I'm out until you guys can straighten up your your chain of command and let me know who I need to take my uh, direction from, I'm out. I mean, so it's quite clear that there's a, there's a, there's a big problem there. And, and again, you know, rather than work with you folks and, and, and straighten these things out, uh, you know, so you guys could come up with some recommendations that would work or at least set them down the right direction. You know, they chose to be defiant and that, that's, and again, then we'll go over to the DOE. Um, the DOE superintendent says you were you were uh, impatient, excessively, or something. Impatient was her was her quote. Uh, I, I think she said that I was uh, impatient and inflexible. You know. Yeah. And um, well, I, I, I saw that. Right, there's no way that can be true. You're such a lovable guy. <laughs> you know, but I saw that, and 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 I want to say, okay, maybe, maybe, because we were trying to get information. Uh, to, to be able to report that really is, like I said earlier, very, very important, at least from my perspective, for the teachers, for the school faculty or, or the school employees, for, for students and their families to know before they made decisions about going back to school. So yeah, impatient and inflexible, yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I, I do wanna say on both the Department of Health, Department of Education, that the time frame that we wanted answers was very expedited. You know, and I know that they're all busy doing their thing and trying to do what they think is best. But that all said, an hour or a couple hours answering an email, answering a letter, sending us policies and procedures about, you know, whether it's contact tracing or about what the schools are going to do if there's a COVID case on campus. I don't think that was that challenging. In fact, on the school side, uh, you know, in, in my office, uh, I, I was telling folks, I don't understand that because that's got to be on someone's desk. You know, schools are opening like, you know, tomorrow kind of thing. And that's got to be on everyone's desk. What happens? What's our procedure when somebody is positive? And it's not like it's never happening. It's happening. So they have to have that like, you know, at their fingertips. So I was really disappointed that we didn't even get that. So we, what we did is we went on their website and we tried to figure out from what's on their public facing website, what are the policies and procedures that are applicable when there's a positive case on campus? And those policies and procedures to us are, are, are conflicting, they're outdated, stuff like three to six feet uh, spacing. I think that was the department's initial position, but I think now they, they decided six feet, uh, stuff like uh, cleaning and disinfecting the rooms. Um, you know, it says you're supposed to do it regularly. Okay, but I heard the superintendent also note that teachers in the HSTA contract, that is their not, not their responsibility. So we wanted to understand who's gonna do it and you know how often are they gonna do stuff like that? Is it the custodial staff that's coming back and, and getting into classrooms more regularly? Uh, don't know, right? So those are questions that are really important. You know, the policies and procedures, the ones that we saw, 
it says that if there's a positive case on campus, not in a building, but on campus, the campus is closed for 21 days. 21 days to clean it, to disinfect it, 21 days. But we know there's been positive cases on campus, uh, summer school, and even, even you know, kind of like today. I never hear of schools closing for 21 days. So I'm gonna guess those policies that we ran across, they're outdated. Uh, and I know things are fluid, things change, but if you don't give us information or you don't give the public information, then all we have to do is look at your website and we're looking at outdated policies, which is not helpful. I think it goes back to the point I think Charlie was making earlier about you know transparency, information is key right now. You know, the more information, the better. It's not the less, the better. It's the more, the better. And oversharing is probably better. You know, so mm -hmm. some of the things that we were frustrated with with the Department of Health, uh, I'm sorry, the Department of Education, is repeatedly in, in writing, as well as during like the Board of Education meeting, the one that happened last week, I hear the superintendent talking about their inability to share information about infections on campus, students, faculty, teachers, whatever, because of the medical privacy law, HIPAA, as well as the, the federal uh, education privacy law, FERPA. Okay, FERPA only applies to students. Okay, so it doesn't apply to teachers. It doesn't apply to faculty. So it doesn't prohibit or bar disclosure of information about teachers, school faculty, families, for sure, because it only applies to students. Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education has actually issued guidance, I think it was in March of this year, about FERPA does not prevent disclosure of non-personal, personally identifiable information about students, okay? HIPAA, which is the medical privacy law. Uh, first of all, I don't even think HIPAA applies to the schools, but the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is the federal agency that oversees that federal law, they've issued guidance that says secondary, elementary and secondary schools generally are not subject to HIPAA. But nevertheless, we hear the department saying, again and again, HIPAA and FERPA prevent us from sharing this information. So in our report, and we didn't get a chance to ask the superintendent or anyone else at the department, how come you think that? Is this true? Maybe we're looking at it at, a, at the wrong angle. Maybe whatever guidance we're looking at, maybe you've gotten advice that says disregard, that's not correct, but we didn't get that chance. So we did include recommendations in our DOE report, our Department of Education report. And one of them is you should consult with the Department of Attorney General now to understand whether or not those federal laws prohibit disclosure of information about infections on campus. It, we're not saying you should, you should print the person's name, not for sure not, but by school, the number of infections, the date of the infection, that information, um, if those laws don't, don't uh, prohibit disclosure, one of the recommendations is that information should come out within 24 hours of the infection or of, of the positive case being identified on that campus. So the, the school community, the public more generally, we would know what's happening on school campuses. Well, you know, one thing that um, Mel and I have always <laughs> have always run across is we were one of the first at the inception of this pandemic back in March. We said, hey, when there's an infection, Okay, when there's an infection, we don't want to know the person's name. Just right. tell us where the infection occurred. They were dropping hip on us as if like, so Mel used the example. So I guess uh, when you get on shock bite, it's okay to release the beach where the guy got bit, right? But I don't see hippo being applied. And uh, they even tell us where the hospital the guy went to. So, you know, there was this kind of mixed messages like, wow. And then later on, maybe... Uh, two months go by, then we realize, no, it's not HIPAA. Because why? They had those infections in the bars. They had the infections in the gym. Now the Department of Health is printing it out. Please, if anybody was in this bar on this certain date, please contact the Department of Health. So now they're asking for help. It's so backwards that they allowed the virus within a virus to spread just within its own policies. That's why we could never get a handle on this virus, plain and simple. Yeah, I think privacy is really important. And I think, you know, maybe uh, in a different time, maybe the approach might be more appropriate. But right now, uh, you know, to the extent that you're not required to withhold information, you know, like I keep saying, to me, the more information, the better. You know, the, it, it, it would really help the public uh, understand what's happening. And, and I think for both of these agencies, I think... Um, the the level of public trust and confidence in what is being put out there by the agencies it's not great 
You know, so that was another disappointment for me, as I thought that if we had been able to get access to both of these departments, that we would have been able to report the clear, consistent, up-to-date information that would have helped start rebuild some of that trust and confidence in these departments. We could have helped them both, I think, and maybe I'm thinking too big of what we do in my office and what these reports would have been, but I thought that it would have been a small step in trying to you know, help both departments rebuild some of that, that trust that might have been lost. And I think 99.9% .9 of us agree with that. I think even to some extent, even the governor would probably, if he's thinking logically and rationally and objectively, he would agree with that statement. But it, I guess the egos and pride might, might be too high. I'm, I'm not sure what the heck is wrong with these people. But the mixed messages, I mean, even if you look at the, the contact tracing, and now you got a bunch of National Guard people in there and, and uh, not necessarily have a clinical background, medical background. Some of them are, are not. And, and I just found out recently that a lot of our DOE, I mean, I'm sorry, state employees, uh, received emails asking for volunteers to be contact tracers uh, for four hours a day. And uh, volunteering, you know, obviously they'll get paid, but volunteering to, to work uh, non-medical people. So again, you know, it's th this, they, they switch them up, the rules change and, it, and it's frustrating, but I think the transparency, Charlie and I, because it is show, we receive more questions from people about the schools or, or about quarantine and all of these things, because there, there really is nowhere to go. And the information changes from the government, from the state, from day to day, and or depending who you talk to. So uh, I, you know, I, I don't know what happens next. Do you have subpoena powers or is this report done? Do you step it up to an audit? Uh, how, you know, now we got OCCC, that, that's another mess that's uh i'm sure somebody's gonna be calling for an investigation or an audit but as far as the two reports that was submitted where do, where do, what happens now is it uh do you guys pursue this is the legislature asking you to to maybe conduct an audit and, and issue subpoenas Have, is there any changes in that um actually uh right now we put these, we're done with these, we put them down and we're moving to something else. I think that, um, you know, one day when all the dust settles, maybe there'll be some post audits, you know, about what people did and how people did things. And, and we can report uh, about, you know, whether it's contact tracing or the Department of Education's procedures, we, we might do another report then. But right now, you know, there's so much right now, I think that, uh, that we can do either real-time audits or just informational reports like what we were trying to do with DOH and, and DOE. So right now, the, the, COVID, the Senate COVID committee has pointed us to look at the travel quarantine. So the travel, the travel self-quarantine program, I think that's what it's called. I think it's contained in the governor's, I think, 10th proclamation, uh, but one of the proclamations. And, and that's the 14-day quarantine for, for travelers, both the uh, I guess now it's been the inner island part is now back in back in force, or at least coming from Oahu. So we are just starting trying to look at at that um, that uh, traveler self quarantine program. Uh, and you know, I, I know that I talked to Mel very briefly about it, and and um, I I'd like to get more information. Maybe you guys can share with me about what's going on on Kauai, how that all works. But I think our intent really is to to provide information from the time a traveler, you know, I guess now with that Safe, app, Safe Travels app, which I think just rolled out again, um, maybe it was yesterday. I think yeah. travelers are able to input information electronically before they even get on the plane. So if that's what happens and we wanna start from there and we wanna track the process all the way through the 14 days when the quarantine ends. But, so we wanna describe that. We wanna understand who has what pieces of that puzzle and, and what their policies, procedures, how they, how they do whatever their responsibilities are for, for each of those pieces of the puzzle. But I think our focus is gonna be on this, uh, I call it the, the monitoring compliance with the quarantine and other people will call it enforcement. It's not the, the arrest. I'm, I'm talking about how do you make sure someone is staying in their place of quarantine for 14 days? So I think our real focus is gonna be when the person gets to their site of quarantine until the 14 days, you know, or, or they get sick or whatever, but 14 days later, how is that being monitored? 
how is that being enforced? So I think that's going to be the real, the guts of this report or what, what we're really going to focus on. But I think our intent is to describe the rest of the process uh, as well, because I'm not sure everyone understands all of the different pieces of this puzzle and whoever, who has responsibility for each piece. You know that the, uh, when you talk about some of the models that's been used and, you know, from day one, uh, we uh, spoke of the Korean model because we had many co on with us that used to be with uh, Office of Economic Development under the Hanuman administration and then called on now she lives in Korea. She was able to describe how they do it. And it seems like that's the gold standards because there, there are some places that uses that and that keeps a very, very well monitored uh, program until such time the person clears and that's, and that's how they run it. Now, I know it was uh, suggested based on the apps that was developed by a Hawaii person in Korea um, that, you know, we could use it here. But then, of course, the governor turned it down. So there was, there was to me, I, and many of us, just when she explained it, there are many opportunities that Hawaii could have capitalized on the experiences of other places. And it's just like, uh, for some reason or another, it was uh, very territorial by the Department of Health, as well as the governor, that, you know, this is... I'm the governor, Anderson, this is my department. So thank you, but no thank you, you know? And uh, and it seemed very apparent from, from the early on stages that that's, what's, that's what we're up against because we could see it unfolding. But yet as, as lay people, you know, we, 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 you know, we just sit back and we just have to go with whatever rules come out. And I think what's getting more frustrating now at this point is only because the economy is suffering and people are, are hurting. So they're at a point that um, they're beyond frustration. And I think, you know, I, I made this statement to the Lieutenant Governor last night. I think what we're doing now, if we bit the bullet early on in a pandemic, we probably would have been open right now, but with a better, with a better handle on everything. But right now, because truly, I don't think we even have the right handle on the contact tracing program as of right now. I, I, don't, I don't think it's accomplished. You know what am I doing? I'm just a Hawaiian guy on this show every night, every night except Sunday. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it, it's it's just a lot of a lot of things could have been done differently. And and again, like I said last night, you know, we gotta from here we kind of look in the rear view mirror, we gotta move forward. And we, you know, we're hoping. I, you know, we just talked about this last night. I told Charlie, you know, and I told the viewers, let's not look in the rear view mirror. Let's look forward. We got new leadership. We got new, and then today, bam! Contact tracing boss gone, walking out. I'm not staying here. It's like, oh God, wait, we'll never get this right, you know. And, and this virus is not stopping. So, you know, it is what it is, and uh, we appreciate what you're doing. I I know you mentioned earlier, uh, if someone wanted to get in touch with your office, if they felt that uh, or they would wanted you to consider maybe looking into some function of the government, state, mostly the state. How can you get in touch with your office? I, I was hoping that when I describe how we do our work, that people would understand that they shouldn't contact us with their little with their little issue. <laughs> because oh, we I, do. I, I thought when I heard you say that, I was thinking, oh, what a brave man. Okay. Call Charlie okay. Iona. Call Charlie Iona. Yeah. And he will talk to you. Yeah. No, I, I, I think the best way that we, we can look at this is, you know, call your respective legislator and, you know, sit and talk with them. And explain, you know, what you have, and if you know, if the if the degree warrants it, I'm I'm pretty sure they'll they'll ship something off to you. And if that it can be exactly correct, Charlie, that that is exactly the process. In all seriousness, yeah. uh, if people that are listening or other members of the public have an issue that they they think deserves an audit, that 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 is really what the process should be. They should contact their legislator, and like I mentioned, you know, at the very beginning, that's where most of our work comes. It comes out of the legislature. So that's the other thing that a lot of people, including legislators, don't even understand what an audit is. You know, they think that we're there getting financial records, but that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to look at agency performance, to, to make sure they're operating efficiently, effectively, et cetera. Um, but, but so that's really like I've been describing. That's really our bread and butter. Okay. You got some busy times up ahead, man. I, I know there's a lot of, we've had a lot of legislators on our show sharing, you know, their concerns and, and the issues. And uh, I just, man, you're going to be a busy guy. You're going to be a busy guy. <laughs> well, lucky we have good people in the office. Yeah. Yeah. What we got to look forward to next is the, uh, the, the quarantine. You're going to be coming out with a quarantine report? 
Yeah, I don't think it's going to be as on an expedited time frame like this. It's probably going to be nearer the end of October, uh, mid to end of October. I think that's what our, our kind of what we're targeting is we're going to do a little more, uh, it, hopefully, in-depth assessment. But also because there's so many different agencies that have, at least my understanding, they have different pieces of, of the of the traveler pro, uh, quarantine program. You know, Department of uh, Transportation Airports Division on Oahu anyway gets the travelers off the airplane and they're responsible for them until they leave the airport baggage claim out the door. I understand on the counties, on the neighbor islands, that it's uh, it's the county folks that are, are handling that that off the plane through baggage claim and maybe even all the way through the end of their quarantine program. So that's what we got to understand and we got to contact the different the different agencies to get a uh, better understanding of what each of their responsibilities are. So this is going to take a little more a little more effort. Yeah, and I don't think you'll get any uh, opposition from the neighbor islands. I think they'll be very cooperative and very proud. I know Kauai will be proud to share what they've done. They've, I mean, Kauai was the first one. I, I'm hearing maybe the, the Maui and the Big Island are doing it now, but uh, it was Kauai was our mayor that put the county resources at the airport. We actually had a checkpoint outside of the airport, um, and, and every car got stopped. And if they didn't, they, you know, then they were double checked again, and now they moved that in inside. And they got a really good thing. And then the, the, the police and the National Guard do the quarantine checks throughout the day. Uh, and they just go from, from address to address to address. But there's still some loopholes that these guys are, are slipping through. But, um, yeah, I'm real proud of our island and what, what we've done. Do, do they get to 100% of the of folks that are on Kauai that, that are subject to the quarantine? And, and all, do they get to 100% of those travelers? Or is it just kind of a random you know, sampling of, of the folks that are oh, no. They go through 100 percent of the of the passengers that show up on the quarantine list. What, what so about what about residents, visitors as well as residents, or is it? It, it actually yeah. it, is, it is residents. I heard some residents had had checks. Absolutely, yeah, yeah okay. residents and, and residents. And and uh, the problem, like I said, some of these guys are using false addresses that cannot be verified before they leave. So we got lo no, uh, local residents here being uh, approached by police and national guard looking for john doe who, who never showed up right because they just used the address so there's some loopholes that we got to fix but for the most part uh these guys are being checked and and uh, the, the good thing about the airport is when they come in if their address is not verified and they don't have a place to stay they have two options get arrested or get back on a plane and go back home and uh what what is not being reported is how many of these guys are being turned around and sent right back home on that same airplane that they came in on uh typically mm -hmm. a delta airline flight so it'll be interesting it'll be uh interesting so yeah i'm, I'm proud of this island. I'm, I'm hoping the other islands are doing the same thing yeah no i think it's gonna be an interesting uh report for us uh, i'm looking forward to learning about uh, the quarantine program and reporting about it it's gonna be good all yeah. right well charlie you got any uh closing comments for mr kondo before he yes Kondo. Sure. The news people call you Kondo. That's not right. You got it right. Yeah. Kondo. Okay. Charles. Yeah. First, I'd like to uh, extend my uh, deepest gratitude to you, Les, for being on tonight, for help uh, sharing what, you know, what your job does. I think, you know, just by looking at the comments, it was uh, well received. So thank you. Uh, and congratulations on all that you do. And uh, I'm glad you, you work very, very closely with the legislature. So that that's, that's, uh, that's a bright spot for our, for our viewers out there. I saw many of your comments tonight. Just remember one thing. He does the reports. He does the audits. He gives it to the person requesting it. And it's basically what they find and they list everything down. And as far as the follow through, it's usually by whoever the requesting party is. But again, if you have any kind of uh, a request from Mr. Kongo, you should go through your legislator and go through that process and you can stop the paper trail there. So I hope you folks enjoyed the show tonight. Over to you, Mel. Right on, Les. Well, thank you again. I, before I forget, Amy Izaki said to tell you hi. She hasn't seen me in a while as well. She texted me today to, 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 tell, you, to tell, you, uh, tell you hi. Um, just want to thank you, man. I mean, it's been a long time um, over the years and, and uh, just a lot of people impressed with, you know, you don't go from OIP to PUC to ethics commission to to uh, the auditor's office by being a flake. Obviously, 
you know, you've proven your worth. Your your integrity is is impeccable, and and uh, you know you're the right guy for that job. And I hope this state will understand and accept that that and and work with you going forward and use you as a resource, as a as a tool to to create a better pro product and better uh, programs for for our people. I mean, hello. So I really appreciate you taking the time tonight. I know we went uh, over the, the time, and I apologize. Uh, for taking taking up that extra time, but we do really appreciate um, you being on tonight. The, the, the comments are awesome. Everybody's up there. Most people didn't know who you were. Now they do. You're going to be a popular guy tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll get you back on. We'll see as things go on. And, and uh, when that next report comes out, I'd love to have you back to, to share your findings on that. Okay. No, it was really nice talking to you guys. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Right on. Well, tomorrow right. night, 7 Tomorrow night, seven o'clock, we got Mayor Kawakami will be on, and we're, we're going to touch on a lot of the things, the changes that's happening, and not so much for Kauai, but going forward. And uh, we'll talk about talk about Kauai and and uh, what what his what his uh, vision is. So uh, seven o'clock tomorrow night, and then Friday we're going to just we're going to try get Tulsi back on. We'll see if yep. Tulsi can come back on. Um, but on Saturday again, we'll have uh, Russell Izumo, uh, Kauai's first. COVID-19 patient uh, had a rough time on Oahu in a coma on the ventilator. He didn't, he, he almost didn't make it, but he'll be uh, with us on Saturday night to share his story and tell you guys to wear your masks. Okay, guys. So again, Les, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Appreciate all your viewers for joining in. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Aloha. We love you guys. Right. Thank you. Take care. Aloha. Thanks, Les. Take care. Yeah. Take care.